Well, that, let's uh, get started. So external collaboration at SharePoint Online. <laughs> so we started talking, I think, broadly across Microsoft 365, and we committed to kind of drill into some SharePoint-specific Q&A on external collaboration, and we got a bunch of feedback from folks. So thank you for uh, – thanks for, for kind of bringing those to us and feeding the, the, the beast, so to speak. We've got a full uh, dance card today. Everybody with their own unique point of view and uh, and style, of course. Um, let's drill in a little bit. We've got a couple things on the agenda. The first is differences in collaborating with team sites and communication sites, and then some of the co common challenges, some of which you've presented to us, others of which we've seen in the wild. So we'll uh, we'll drill in first on the team site versus communication site. Just some of the some of the differences to be thinking about here. Emily, you want to start on this? Absolutely. So. Typically, the team sites, the external sharing is on by default when you set up your tenant, and that's usually where people are doing most of their external sharing. There are some edge cases where you're not actually collaborating on content, but you want to be sharing content externally to specific audiences, and you can actually externally share with the communication sites. You just can't do it from the site itself until you go to the admin center and turn on that external sharing, which I have in the next slide. You have three different flavors of that, anyone, new and existing guests, and then existing guests only. Some of the use cases you might want to use this for, maybe you want to have onboarding available to new employees before they join the organization. Maybe you have an external board or investors and you want to be communicating out updates in your company to them and having somewhere for them to go. So you can use communication sites for that. Now, you can sync hub permissions, but let's say we have a communication site as our hub and we have external sharing external sharing turned on, and then we have a communication site associated with that hub site, it will not turn on that external sharing for you. So that is something that you need to do in the admin center for all of them. And just be warned that syncing those hub site permissions can take up to four hours. So there can be quite a delay on that. It's almost like they thought that through a little bit, right? You know, not yeah. making communication sites shareable by default because they're likely to be part of your intranet. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, I, I like love that. when people think it's wonderful. And and as M was talking about how it doesn't get set automatically, I was just thinking another job for PowerShell. Just uh, mm -hmm. join a bunch <laughs> up. Just, just so one of the things that folks job. brought to us is is that the sometimes there's options that just just aren't available to us. Let's let's talk a little bit about why that might be. Uh, yeah, I think we were talking about this the other day about the sharing, like how we share and how everybody shares individually because of the experiences they've had, right? Like we all kind of do it differently. Is that what we're talking about? And the well, picture that's on screen right now, the option just not even being available to us. Right. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I, I don't have the deck up. I can't see our notes, but I, I like this and I don't like this. So as the admin, I, I, I hate this because if you look through, it's like, please contact your admin, blah, and that's always, you know, nasty grams to me. Um, but I do like that it's discoverable because I hate that thing where, where things you can't do are hidden. So if you're trying to share something and you can't remember where it's at and you're looking around to the share with somebody else, if they just security trimmed it out because it wasn't available, I wouldn't like that as much. Uh, but I do like that, that it does say, you know, anyone with the link, it's grayed out so you can't pick it. And then it says, you know, your organization is uh, telling you that you can't do it. Uh, later in the deck, I've, I've got a couple of slides on how to change that. Uh, but I do like that, that it gives you that and it tells you, you know, it shows it to you, but tells you why it can't do it. So you have a, a chance to try to remedy it. I appreciate that. And Todd, I think to go back to Emily's uh, prior slide, I think it was, it was right here, right? Only people in your organization, the, uh, the, the option right underneath the green box. That's what's so, going to result in that being grayed out. Uh, no, I think anything besides the top one so yeah I mean, or maybe the bottom one yeah yeah i think you're right yep i think you're right that it, that if you click that that's what, what results in that we know we know what causes this right yeah yeah the interest the interesting thing is to me in most organizations it sort of makes some a bunch of decisions and never communicates these out so you see things that are grayed out or that work a little bit differently than what you see in slides like this and you wonder why and you don't know who to talk to about it. So, so that 
mythical administrator, <laughs> you know, poor, poor, poor person who's like in a, locked in a, in a cabinet somewhere and you have no idea who they are. It's, it's always sort of unclear what you might do if you did want to uh, communicate with somebody outside your organization and, and didn't, you know, didn't feel like it was set correctly. So we'll talk a little bit more about what the benefits are. That one in the middle is one that you see all the time especially if you work in more than one tenant. So, yeah. you know, you might be logged in with one tenant and and try to go to another tenant. That's exactly what I did there. And I think that the, the for for that one one of the better solutions is to use profiles in your browser so that you're sure that you're connected to the tenant you think you are because sometimes this is just plain old user error, you know. I, I know I could get to this site. What's the problem? And people don't read what it says there. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm seeing that my Comcast account is not allowed into my uh, de development tenant. And that makes total sense. But there are too many words on there. So I don't necessarily read it. Yeah. So you just want to make sure you're logged into the account that you think you are. Yeah. And we've, I, we're gonna, I think we're going to hit that late. Yeah. We've got that in a couple later slides. This is, let's uh, drill in. Yeah, let's drill in to the that sharing dialogue a little bit and our options for for sharing here. Yeah. Yay! This, this, and now where I was all confused in the previous There it slide. is. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Which it's, slide are we on, Julie? Yeah, it's slide eight. So uh, the one thing I really like about this, and I wanted to talk about in case there are any uh, people who are are a little slow like I am, there's that that on the, the center box there that people with existing access. For far longer than it should have, the reason for that link stumped me because I, I I came from you know the old SharePoint world and in my head I know in the background what this is doing is this is creating item level permissions and all that kind of stuff and I was really myopically looking at it that way and I couldn't figure out why you would want to give somebody permission who already has permission because they've already got permission, but but I asked somebody I don't remember who it was and they're like well it's it's kind of a little nudge so if I want Mark to work on a document or Mark says hey where's that where's the ask some praxis deck for Thursday I can go in here and I can pick that I know he's got access to it but he's got access to you know a thousand files on our site but that people with ex existing access is a quick easy way to give somebody that already has access, you know, here's that document I want you to work on, or here's that proposal without telling them to go search for it or, or anything like that. So once I realized what that was for and how I use it all the time, I feel like I might've been the last person on earth that, that knew what that was for. Um, on the other side of this, <laughs> on the other side of the spectrum, that one is my favorite because from a governance perspective, people are unintentionally breaking inheritance and opening up permissions all of the time. And unfortunately, that's not something you can set at the tenant level yet. It's something that you can only set at the site level. Yes, we need to turn off sharing. Sharing is not caring about your permission management. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. That, that, I mean, the people with existing access is just the safest one that's there, right? Yeah. It's, you're not changing anything, you're, you know, anyone with the link or specific people, or even people in some, some practices consulting in this example, would, would change the permission, potentially change the permissions on that object, but people with existing access doesn't. So, right. I mean, that that's the one I use the most often to ship yeah. links around inside the company and inside my clients. Because in terms that's, of a it's, better practice, that feels like yeah. something that we can say, wherever you have the ability to use that, that's the one I would certainly default to for the reason that you're not changing permissions, you're giving people just easier access to what they already have, right? Yeah, right. and where this ends up becoming more useful is when you're not in share. I mean, if we think about the past, when we were in 2010 or 2013, sharing was more about you're in SharePoint and you literally are copying the URL to the thing. And now because... We have OneDrive and all these other places where we actually have the synced document. We are sharing from places where we don't have the URL available to us. But we were talking when we were doing the prep here about this email thing, and Matt Wade just commented yeah. on it in the chat. Never do I use the to and my message and the send. I always use the copy link. You know, so that's a little bit separate from the the setting. The permission issue is the. And then we were sort of talking about the fact that this email message, although it does sort of indicate that it was sent by you as the person who clicked the send button, it kind of feels spammy and like yeah, maybe I shouldn't click on this link. And, 
you know, it's sketchy. Like I, I just, I don't use it. I like copy the link and then paste that into the email in the context of the conversation I'm having or in chat and teams or whatever it is. Yeah. And I think I it was think... that we talked about that, con the, excuse me, the context being the most important. Is it just yeah. sending somebody a random link is one thing, but saying, hey, Emily, I need you to review and comment on this document for tomorrow, provide you with that ability and, and not in that sort of spammy automated email way. Yeah. Uh, so when we were talking about this for our prep, uh, uh, it was interesting, a couple of things that came up. Number one, the the image on the right, the one that comes from Emily, that's that message you get if you use that, the, the mail thing. That's very formulaic and the bad guys know that. So it's very easy for them to spoof that and trick you into clicking something that you shouldn't uh, do that. The company my wife works for does not use Office 365. One of the things that I'm most ashamed about. Um, and she gets those emails once in a while because she, she works for a publicly traded company. People's names and email addresses are out on the website. So bad guys can look and see who the COO is and see the CEO is and craft these kind of things and say, hey, Mr. CEO, this person shared it and try to trick people into clicking stuff. Uh, so that's another great reason not to use those, but to do it in context because um, it makes them uh, yeah. tougher to, to spoof. Todd, you've got a lot more to be ashamed about than that, man. You've got to <laughs> work harder on that. <laughs> well, you know, I've got it's, it is a long list, and the you know the top it moves around, but you know. Yep. So to Matt to Matt Wade's <laughs> comment, Control K is probably one of my favorite sh keyboard shortcuts in the world, right? So I'm not just pay, I'm not just Control C Control Ving this big long GUID link into an email or a chat. I'm writing like the proposal that's due tomorrow highlighting it control K and putting a link on the, on the descriptive terms. So yeah. there's no click here's, there's no big ugly goo. It's in your URLs. It's very much in context and on point. Yeah. And to that, we were talking about that in the prep. Mark brought up an interesting thing that I'd kind of not paid a lot of attention to. Apparently if you're on windows, um, if you're using the outlook client and you do the thing that, that Mike just mentioned, that URL has a very ugly format to it and it's not obvious what it goes to. And it's got some sharing stuff. But the Outlook client is smart enough to resolve that if the person you're sending the email to is in your tenant and it puts a, a friendlier URL in there for you. Uh, so I really like that there's just a lot of smarts going on behind the scenes. So I, I definitely like that. And, and, and Outlook will tell you whether it can verify the person has access to that link or not. Um, so there's some some fun stuff in there. Yeah. The Mac Before client we, for Outlook does ahead, not yeah. support that yet. <laughs> Yeah, oh, I figured you Derek, Mac you and users. Matt, you and Matt would be highlighting the Mac client differences. <laughs> one of, one of the things, Mac client. one one of the things it I think just it works, it's just not that way. <laughs> You're holding it, it wrong. Like, works like a Mac. One of, one of the things that I think, from an administrative standpoint, you should always think about is even this dialogue that is actually pretty simple and makes some sense if you apply your brain to it people will be most likely take whatever default option you yeah. you've given them so in your organization make sure that you think about well how how do you feel about sharing and what should the default be and then how should you ed educate people in your in your organization the nice thing is that that sharing dialogue does show up you know like if i'm sharing a a drive a a, a file in my OneDrive that's synced locally to my hard drive. I get that same same uh, sharing link. I get the same thing in, in SharePoint. I get the same thing in Teams. So it's a very consistent experience, but don't expect that people are reading what's on that screen if you just uh, you know leave the default uh, somewhere where you don't really want them to be. Yeah, I think that's, that's a good thing. And there's like that's a very well established thing. Now there are books written about it. There's one called nudge that talks about that, that if you just make the default, what you want people to do, they will likely just do it. And there's some settings for sharing in here. So I like making the default, you know, people with existing access. I, like I was just going to say that feels like the right choice. Yeah. And I like making the default to not allow editing. So you don't accidentally uh, set that if you're not paying attention. Was that yep. not a lament that, of, of Emily's that you can't set people with existing access on a tenant wide basis default? You can only Correct. do it on a site by site basis? Correct. Which, uh, if, if there's something on user voice or the, you know, whatever, user, yeah. whatever <laughs> user voice is now, where we could vote that up, I think we've been talking well, about that we, for a long time. Even worse, it didn't used to be, it used to be that you couldn't set it as the default at all. Yep. And that, 
that's the one that makes the most sense. I think. Just never enough for you. So they give it to us on the site level. Just, and the first thing out of your mouth is, why can't I do it at the center? Right. Right. Every never BI project ever. That's really interesting. But what would be really cool is if, <laughs> <laughs> if we had an export to Excel button. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere Which Scott Hillier is slight, is Yeah, exactly. Us. Yeah, slight inside joke, but. <clears throat> All right, so shall we fl shall we move into the kind of this is I think a narrower audience, right? This is the multiple tenants conversation. Mm. Julie, you had a, a comment on this with when you have personal and work accounts with the same. Yeah, credentials. yeah, I was I was gonna get to the point where um, what my experience has been is that this is probably not as much of a problem for somebody with one. So let's use the work and school account situation, and you have a work and school account. And you're collaborating with somebody else who has their tenant and they externally share with your work and school account. So that then means that you don't really have to have a, def a different browser profile because you're still logged in with your credentials and they're going to work in both tenants. The problem becomes is when you actually have an account in both tenants. And so now when you go try to log in to that other tenant with your browser profile where you're logged in with your tenant credentials. Now you're getting this you know, error issue where it's like, hey, the, you don't have access to this. This becomes also kind of weird when you have certain resources that allow you to sign in with a live account and sign, let you sign in with a work and school account. And so then the browser profile is interesting. I've noticed recently, especially with the Credge or Chromium Edge browser, the new Edge browser, that I can be signed in with both my live account and my, um, and my work and school account in the same browser, browser profile. And it kind of knows as long as when I'm in an, uh, picking something that only allows a work and school account. It just knows to use my work and school account. And when I, it, it's, it's a live thing or, you know, like a Xbox or something like that, when I'm logging into that, it knows to use my live one and it allow me to be in the same browser profile, and not have a problem. But then you get into the situation where you go to a website that allows both. And now it's like, which one do you want to use? And you're getting all confused again. So I think this is more a consultant issue, like where you're ending up with multiple tenant accounts. I mean, we have seven, eight, nine, ten actual unique tenant accounts. And so then it gets a little bit more tricky and you need the browser profiles. But that's been my general experience with this. Yeah, Julie, I think if you're if you're enough a sophisticated enough user to have multiple accounts in multiple 365 tenants, look just yeah. knowing to right click on the link and paste it into the right profile, you know, the right browser session at the yeah. right time is crucial. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing with that is if you're using Edge, well, if you're not even using Edge, shame on you. But if you are using Edge, if you don't want to do the copy-paste thing, one of the multiple profile settings can be open link in latest profile. So if I know which uh, tenant it's going to be in, I can just click that that instance of Edge and then go back to Outlook and click the link and it'll pop up in the last one I was in. So you don't have to do the copy-paste dance. Anything else on this, or do we beat it to death pretty well? I think here we've got eleven more minutes. I think we can hash over it again. Um. <laughs> let's talk. Let's talk NAV because we uh, we don't all see the same NAV all the time. Emily, thanks yeah. for writing this up. Do you want to talk yeah. through it? Absolutely. So we got the question on Twitter: Why can a Sherry see all my NAV links, and how do I hide them? So I did some testing on that, and great news: your external users cannot. So if you share, let's say, a document or just a page with an external user and they don't have access to other items in the communication site, team site, or hub nav, they won't see those other options and external users won't see that SharePoint app bar. Now, if you have internal users and you share just a document or just a page, they're not going to see those different libraries and other items in the nav they don't have access to. But if you're linking to other items in the hub nav or SharePoint app bar, you do have to audience target those ones. So it's generally pretty smart, but those are the two areas you really want to pay attention to. And the thing that's um, that's not here that's probably an exception to this is if you have custom global navigation. Sure. I think, Julie, I think, Julie, there's a simple programmatic way to not expose it to external users. Yeah, I mean, you can um, you can check when you're in the code. You can tell 
uh, through the page properties, whether someone's a guest user or anonymous user. So you can just stop the um, solution from rendering, um, the app customizer from rendering in those uh, situations. So we do that. And you can also tell if you're in Teams and not render in there. So there's a lot of decision making you can make programmatically, obviously. That's something we've done for a large global organization with tens of thousands of guest users, right? External people, some of whom are onboarded and some of whom are not. And that's been, we don't, those, not all those people should be browsing the organization to know the chain of command from the CFO on down, for example, or, you know, organizational news that shows up in our global nav. Awesome. Thank you. Controlling who has access to share. Is this a bill then? It looks like it's. Yeah, so these yeah. are the uh, two screenshots that I contributed to today's uh, presentation. Oh, cool. Yeah, so this is, we were lamenting earlier about uh, not being able to make the default, you know, people with existing access and, and all that. This is where this and where that and all the other uh, settings are at. So I, I bring this up, number one, I, I, I have Snagit and I love making shapes and drawing so you can tell it looks like a five-year-old with a crayon put this screenshot up. Um, but in the, the URL up there, we're in the admin setting, you know, the, the SharePoint admin. And then on the left under policies, we're, we're looking at sharing. And then I expanded the more external sharing settings to kind of show you what all the things were. So you'll notice at the top, SharePoint and OneDrive have separate sharing uh, levels. And SharePoint always has to be more permissive than OneDrive does. So the idea being they don't want, if, if IT says you can't you know, share externally in SharePoint, they don't want you just moving a file over to OneDrive and, and enabling you know, OneDrive to share externally. So OneDrive is always going to be uh, less permissive or as permissive. And then that part at the bottom that I outlined and the arrow that goes to the other part that I should have outlined is how you can control which domains externally you can share to. So this is uh, getting into a situation where, you know, maybe you don't want to share externally, but yet you've got some auditors and you want to share files with them and you don't want people emailing them. Uh, so here you could say limit the external sharing, but only to these specific domains. And you could add, you know, E and Y or whatever. This is important because we're at a spot now as IT folks where people have better software at home to do these kind of things. So if we just came down and said, we're not going to allow external sharing, that's just, the, and somebody in accounting is like, hey, I need to uh, I need to share with somebody at ENY. I'm like, nope, no external account uh, sharing. They'll use something else. Uh, so we want to make sure that we can allow them to do that. So this is the way that we can say, uh, share to specific domains or block domains, anybody but gmail.com, whatever. Uh, another great thing in there is you can also just point out specific people that can share externally. So there's that whole managed security groups, and you can say, this group of people inside of the company can share externally, but nobody else can. These settings are at the tenant hey. site. Did we have a question? Can we block domains by team, do you know? Uh, block domains by team. Is that what you asked? Yes. Okay. So sort of nice segue, uh, Russ. So those settings were at the tenant level. That next screenshot is at the site level. So this is like the old days on SharePoint on-prem where you said, I want to allow anonymous access. You had to turn it on at the farm level and then turn it on again at the web app level. This is the same thing. So these controls filter down. So the tenant admin sets the ones on the left. And then for each site, you have additional settings for that site that are a subset of the tenant level one. So uh, here's where that setting only uh, people, people who have existing permission, and then you can also do uh, change the domains that are blocked or added per site. So I would assume that would impact the team as well. I've not tested it specifically from teams. Um, yeah, I yes. think that just does their point side, not the teams piece itself. Right. Yeah, I think we've got think question number totally one for our teams that. deep dive next. Yeah, week. I think I think that would be in the teams admin center, and I think that will be in our other session. Yeah, go two we'll weeks do. to uh, research it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this I, I bring this up to just kind of head it home that that if you get something a domain <clears throat> added at the tenant level because of some new initiative, you still need to go to the site level if it gets enabled. It you know, it's a two step thing. Um, so. I think I think this is another one of those things where it goes it goes haywire pretty fast if you're setting on a site by site thing. You know, you you really want to have a strategy at a higher level, which 
I know most of the organizations I work with, they sort of get to the point where they go, ooh, crap, we should have a strategy at a higher level. But in the meantime, they've set a bunch of sites in different ways. So that may actually be appropriate. Not every site should have the same sharing settings, but having some sort of strategy around it where, you know, sites of this type should have this these settings, sites, sites of this type should have those settings will make your life a lot easier. Just like SharePoint permissions going off the off haywire when when we don't think about them ahead of time. Yeah. Yeah. And to that point, if you look at that that far right one, the bottom two are same as my organizational settings. And then the, the very bottom, there's that blue link that says reset to my organizational settings. So if you come by it after the fact and you define your ones at the tenant level the way you should have, you can go back to your sites and, and line them up so they're not one offs. So before I, I, we flip to uh, some dev specific, we got about five minutes left. Some dev specific love for the devs on the call, um, Julie. I know you're in the you're the chat's pretty active, and and you're in. Is there anything we should kind of break real quickly and address? Yeah, I'm not quite sure wh what it was referencing because I was trying to answer 30 things at once. But does yeah. um, Greg ask? Does this apply to sites that have M365 groups attached to it? So I think he means the sharing access. Right? Is that right? Yeah, I believe they do. I mean, I, at this point, obviously not communication sites, but I assume every sites are M365 attached anymore. So, yeah, I, I, I know a couple of clients who are, are still creating team sites without an M365 group behind them. So I think I think that the same sharing settings would would exist in both cases, though. That's my feeling as well. Um. Shoy asked, even if you have external sharing disabled for SharePoint at the tenant level? That was part of a thread. Um, yeah, and I think she must mean it was right after the group. So I think it's this access who has access to share. It's not entirely clear what the question is related to. But, well, you can't you can't make any specific site more permissive than the tenant settings. Is that right, Todd? Correct. Yeah. So so yeah, anything so. anything that you've done on the left side of the of the screen would limit what you can do on the right side of the screen. Right. right. So I think that is what she's asking. Yeah. Cool. I think that's all, all right. the questions. You, let's you give would some, think let's give Joy, some developer but, love here. <laughs> Joy says you would think, but you know, sometimes you would think Test a it lot out. of things. Trust right? but verify. Yeah, trust but verify. Oh, she is love. okay. She's saying no, I'm saying that's how it is. Okay, cool. Um right. So app catalog and SharePoint framework solutions. So this came up because of a learning pathways question, but um, it's it's just in general related to any SharePoint framework solution. Uh, a common issue is that users, uh, guest users, will uh, come to be invited into a site and they will not be able to see the customizations that were added to that site via SharePoint framework, either app customizers or web parts or, or whatever those uh, customizations might be. And so this is pretty common. There's a couple of ways to solve it. Uh, the most recommended one is to turn on the public uh, CDN. So the SharePoint CD, public CDN, I put a little, I grabbed the screen graphic of how it works. Basically what it does is that it takes uh, the document library where the manifest for the SharePoint framework are stored and it put it in, it exposes it on a public URL. And so what that solves is that when the guest comes to the site collection, their ability to get the code for the SharePoint framework solution comes from a publicly available URL and thereby they can load the code from the tenant app catalog that they don't actually have access to because the tenant app catalog is just a fancy SharePoint site collection. And so they're able to load that code because it's on a public CDN and therefore the solutions will run in that uh, site collection. Another way to solve it if you are not open to doing, turning the public CDN on, um, and reasons you might not want to turn a public CDN on is if you had proprietary calculations or, or code in your SharePoint framework solutions, that might be a reason why you wouldn't want to uh, turn that on. But otherwise, there's there's not a lot of risk. I mean, in, unless, you know, like I said, there's proprietary information in your code. Um, but otherwise, 
Um, you can also uh, add the everyone group, not everyone uh, except in external users, but the everyone group, which you have to go and re-enable with PowerShell to be able to make it work. Um, you can add that group to the um, library that holds the SharePoint framework solutions in the tenant app catalog. And as long as everyone, even guest users then, have access to that, read that um, library, then they'll be able to get to the SharePoint framework solutions. So that's the very complicated long story. And I think the links to be able to do some of this stuff are in our resources. Speaking of, and we are at the top of the hour, so we'll just kind of enumerate a couple of, anything that we want to underscore here for folks? Any highlights that, that we should know that we talked about CDN, adding guests, et cetera. I think, I think there are, you know, we have different audiences for all of this, you know, be sort of the end user, the people who are administrating, the people who are writing code against the platform, each, each person's going to want to look at different some of these different resources here and think about it from different angles. Yep. So these, they're probably not all general purpose. Something for everybody, a bouquet yep. of, of a resources. Bouquet. So two weeks from now, we're going to do the same thing, but we're going to drill specifically into teams. So thank you for some of the questions today we've been jotting down. I think if you've got additional questions, what's the easiest way for people to submit them? Um, you can add them in the chat. Or, or the link on the slide. The link yep. on the slide for the form, or yep. reach out to us in Twitter, or yeah. lots yeah. of different social media. Awesome. So two weeks from today, a little deeper dive into Teams. Hopefully we covered stuff that means that means something to you in SharePoint today. Feel free to keep the conversation going in chat or uh, the, uh, the other media we talked about. With that, we're at the top of the hour. Thank you, everybody, for uh, for putting this together, for contributing your thoughts and your, especially your questions and your ideas, makes us sharper, keeps us on our toes. We appreciate it. Yeah. yeah thanks, everybody, for thanks coming. Everybody, bye bye. Thanks, thanks everybody. everybody. See you in two weeks.